So here we go. We can just uh, proceed to the agenda. Thank you. So um, for those of, of you who does not know me, I'm a law professor at the law faculty uh, of the University in Bergen. Um, I know that uh, the background of the participants uh, differs quite a lot. Some of you are very familiar with the taxonomy regime and some of you hardly know it at all. So it's my task today to, to give a brief overview of the EU taxonomy regime uh, to, to make sort of a um, common platform for uh, the next speakers today and also for the speakers on the 19th of May. So um, I think of going through some uh, fundamental uh, objectives and values connected to the taxonomy uh, regime. Uh, very shortly on, on the scope of the taxonomy, uh, I will um, I will dwell a bit on, on uh, the main rules and principles in the uh, taxonomy regu regulation. And if there's time, maybe we can uh, try to figure out what's coming next. But first, as indicated in the agenda, a little bit about the background and the development of the EU taxonomy. So please, next slide. Thank you. So even though we speak about an EU taxonomy, it's important to be aware of that uh, there is a direct link from the taxonomy regulation to the UN Sustainable Goals. To recapitulate a bit here, in September 2015, the UN launched the so-called Agenda 2030 and the seventh, uh, 17 uh, Development Goals. Now, climate change was considered vital to take action on at a global level. And already in December 2015, the Paris Agreement, Agreement was concluded. Now, this is a public international binding convention signed by 189 states. And in this connection, it's also signed by the EU. And that's a bit special uh, that an organization is a party to the convention, but the EU is. So the EU as such is bound by the Paris Agreement. Now, if we look into the Paris Agreement, I think this Article 2a is the most famous uh, provision of the Paris Agreement, uh, stating the, the goal of uh, holding the increase of the global temperature below two degrees centigrade, preferably below one and a half degrees. So that's familiar to, to most of you, I would guess. But the uh, Paris Agreement also have other important provisions, important in the development of, of sustainable finance. According to Article 2, uh, Litra F, uh, the, the parties to the Paris Agreement um, are committed to making finance flow consistent with the pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So that is important in the context of the taxonomy. And there are also uh, provisions in the Paris Agreement um, uh, 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 Determine, uh, determining or uh, making the, the states um, obliged to give uh, national contributions and report on uh, those. So there are several articles in the, in the Paris uh, Agreement on, uh, on report, making reports 
that's also uh, important to be aware of when we discuss the taxonomy later. So next slide, please. Just after the, uh, uh, the signing of the Paris Agreement, the EU declared that they had an ambition of being in the forefront globally in the development of sustainable finance. And already in, in January uh, 2016, a high level expert group was established. Um, it was a, talk, a task of this high level ex expert group to give advice on how to steer the flow of capital towards sustainable investments. The high level expert group gave an interim report in 2017 and a final report in January 2018. And immediately afterwards, the European Commission uh, published an action plan um, to, uh, to take the recommendations from the high level expert group further. Now, I had a presentation at the Energy Lab in May 2018. And at that time, um, we knew about this expert group report, and we also knew about the action plan. And in the action plan, it was stated that there was a need for a, a, a taxonomy uh, regulation, but we did not know at the time how this regulation was, uh, how the content was, uh, content of that regulation was meant to be. Um, the financial um, sector was very early uh, highlighted as a key to be successful in um, channeling the investments and capital towards uh, sustainable activities. And what we got first was a regulation in 2019, a regulation on sustainability related disclosure for the financial sector. A year after, then in 2020, we got the taxonomy regulation. And these two re regulations must be seen together when we are discussing the taxonomy. So um, next slide, please. Just very few words on, on the main objectives and uh, fundamental values according to the uh, sustainability disclosure regulation. According to this regulation, uh, financial market participants must give information towards end investors uh, regarding how sustainability risks are integrated into investment decisions, how sustainability risks are integrated into the investments or insurance advice, they must give clear and reasoned explanations of, of whether, and if so, how a financial product considers principal adverse impacts on sustainability factors. Information must be given on environmental and social impacts, as well as company governance. And information must be given at both company level and product level. And this regulation also have requirements on how and where the information is to be given. Next slide, please. So, as I said, the two regulations must be seen together. And there are uh, uh, some of the um, fundamental goals and values which are the same for the two regulations. For instance, the goal of directing investments and capital towards sustainable activity is the same for the two regulations. Also to protect invest investors by improving the quality of information given to end investors. Both regulations um, are supposed to making it easier for end investors to compare sustainable investment possibilities. 
uh, both of the regulation fosters transparency and they try to avoid greenwashing. And um, by these uh, regulations, there will be a um, harmonized regime on reporting on sustainability in the internal market. So there will be a unified understanding of what is sustainable economic activity and also there will be reporting in the same manner within the EU. So next slide. Please. If we are to highlight uh, some of the, the goals and values uh, being especially important for the taxonomy regulation, it is to establish a common understanding within the EU of which activities and investment uh, that are considered as environmentally sustainable. It is to promote trans uh, transparency and the te taxonomy also makes it possible to create European standards, for instance, for green bonds, common European branding for a sustainable financial product aimed at consumers and to reduce possibility for greenwashing. Next slide. A few words also about uh, the scope of the taxonomy regulation. Who is the regulation applicable to? Well, according to Article 1, 2, uh, of, of this uh, regulation. The regulation is applicable to EU itself and to member states. Uh, and this is um, so when member states or the EU set public measures or set standards or requirement for financial market participants or financial products or corporate bonds that uh, brand uh, environmentally sustainable products. Financial sector is also included in, uh, in the taxonomy uh, regulation, Article uh, 1 to B. Um, I will not go into the details here, but um, uh, well, by and large, it's the same uh, participants that will be uh, uh, governed by the two regulations. Some deviations, but by and large. Um, for financial market participants, uh, for those that are incorporating or branding ESG considerations in their line of products, it is mandatory for them to disclose the taxonomy alignment of the, that financial product. And for other financial market participants, they must either disclose, uh, disclose their alignment or they must declare that the EU taxonomy has not been taken into account. In Article 1 to C, you will see that some undertakings um, outside the financial sectors are also covered by the taxonomy regulation. Um, these are in practice big companies with more than 500 employees. It's a bit awkward way of writing this, referring to another directive and so on, but um, from a bird's perspective, it's fair to say that it, it is the real, really big companies that are um, uh, covered by the, the taxonomy regulation. So next slide. Now this is one of the core uh, provisions in, in the taxonomy regulation. And this provision explains how one decide what is an environmentally sustainable economic activity? And you will see that there are several criteria to be met under this uh, provision. Article 3 
uh, is meant to take a holistic approach when deciding an environmentally sustainable economic activity and several parameters have to be met. First of all, the economic activity must contribute substantially to one or more of the environmental objectives that is set out in Article 9. Uh, we will have a peek into Article 9 in, in just a very short while. But uh, the activity must contribute substantially to reach one of the environmental objectives or goals. At the same time, the economic activity must not harm significantly, uh, significantly any of the environmental goals set out in Article 9. And the economic um, activity must be carried out in compliance with minimum safeguards that's laid uh, out in Article 19 of the regulations. And, and this minimum safeguards are in short respect of human rights and minimum labor rights. As stated in uh, the OECD guidelines of the multinational enterprises, the UN guiding principles on businesses and human rights, and also in eight ILO conventions. And in addition to this, the economic activity must comply with the technical screening criteria that are set out um, in the frame of Articles 10 to 15. So the next slide. It is an overview of the environmental objectives that the economic activity must contribute substantial to reach and must not uh, significantly harm. And if you take a brief look at these um, uh, environmental objectives, you will see that the first two of them they relate to climate change, whereas the next ones are different in nature. And we, when we later on are, are talking about the screening criteria and, and go more into the details of them, um, so far it is screening criteria related to uh, litra A and B here, climate change mitigation and climate change adoption that has been made. So the next slide. Uh, the, this um, high-level expert group have uh, tried to visualize how how the um, decision is to be made of what uh, of whether or not an economic activity is environmentally sustainable, and. You will see here that we have the six environmental goals or environmental objectives. And in order to, to be labeled as uh, uh, environmentally sustainable uh, economic activity, the activity must substantially contribute to reach one of the, at least one of the, the uh, environmental objectives. It must not significantly harm any of the um, objectives. It must comply with minimum safeguard uh, criteria, and it must comply with the screening criteria. So this holistic um, approach and, and the, uh, the way of reasoning is important to have in mind in the uh, in the uh, following sequences as well. Mm. Bartel, yes. uh, you are you are spending your time, so I think I, you. I, I know. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. So I, I'll rush through some of the the next slide, but this one was important to 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 uh, spend some time on. So next slide. It's only to explain that 
the step from the taxonomy regulation into the screening area um, goes through articles 10 to 15. Uh, article 10 uh, gives more detail on uh, climate change mitigation, the first of the envi environmental um, goals. And from uh, Article 10, we are, um, uh, we are uh, channeled over to the screening criteria. So the next one. Yeah, I think perhaps uh, we can uh, discuss what's next in, in the line of a question that can be something that we return to. Uh, I talked about this high level expert group that uh, presented the, uh, the taxonomy regulation and, and uh, sort of made the, the uh, initial work on it. Uh, there is also an expert group called the panel that will supervise how this uh, screening criteria is be being used and also um, and also work on um, amendments and so on that is um, uh, necessary to do afterwards. So um, there will be, these uh, screening criteria are not carved in stone, they are kind of living instruments and they will be developed. Yes, next slide. Yeah, I, I think we can just, there are sub work groups in this um, uh, platform. Uh, so this is just a, um, an overview of what they're working on at, at the moment. But perhaps a few words on the next slide. Because these uh, uh, regulation, the taxonomy uh, regulation and the disclosure re uh, regulation are being considered EEA relevant, um, they are um, uh, there is a, a suggestion of um, implementing them into Norwegian law and this proposal has been on hearing. The hearing was concluded in January 2021 and this is under its work and we are waiting for the, uh, this um, legislation process to proceed and finalize. So thank you for the attention. OK, great. So uh, thanks for letting me speak uh, on um, what is, uh, at least in my opinion, the most uh, interesting and fascinating piece of uh, legislation at the moment. Uh, it's a really ambitious project that the EU has embarked on. Um, my name is uh, Daniel Nasse and I'm a lawyer with the PwC law firm in Bergen. And I focus uh, mainly on financial regulatory and for the last few years also sustainability regulatory matters. Um, <clears throat> I will look at um, the assessment method and uh, technical criteria for uh, use of the taxonomy and then uh, into the reporting obligations of uh, the <clears throat> players that are uh, directly affected and, and then what uh, indirect effects um, will the taxonomy have. And if there's time I will also go into um, I will also go into uh, what is next. First, um, a few words on, on what is the taxonomy and what is it not. Um, supplementing on what Bert Elen said, uh, <clears throat> it's a system for classification of uh, economic activities, uh, setting criteria for what is actually environmentally sustainable or taxonomy aligned. I will refer it to it from now on. Uh, to my knowledge, it's the first uh, legal standard defining what is actually environmentally sustainable. Uh, the taxonomy itself, it's a, it's a binary system with uh, science-based criteria. Uh, binary in the sense that you are either, your activity is either uh, environmentally sustainable or it's not. Um, although, the, as we will see later on, the reporting itself is not going to be binary, but rather very complex. Um, also comment on the science-based criteria. This is the fundament of, of the idea behind the taxonomy, uh, but also some of the complaints uh, in the later rounds of delegated acts have been that 
we have moved a little bit away from the science based criteria and over to political topics and energy is maybe the, the most um, uh, the, the, the sector that is most affected by that. Uh, also, it's, it's important to note that the taxonomy does not prohibit any activity uh, or, or financing of any activity, but it's, it's rather meant as, an, as, an, as a disclosure and um, uh, incentive systems uh, and imposes reporting duties for certain companies. As uh, Bartelian mentioned as well, not all sectors and not all like, economic activity uh, have uh, criteria in this first round. Uh, the EU has focused on um, on the uh, sectors that have the most uh, greenhouse gas emissions, being these uh, nine sectors that have criteria for both environmental objectives one and two, and then additional uh, four uh, sectors for uh, objective two. Uh, and then within these sectors again are uh, criteria for specific activities, and uh, they're not uh, well. Not not all activities within each of the sectors have criteria. Um, the taxonomy alignment test, uh, but then went through that, so I will just comment briefly that uh, the technical criteria relate to uh, the test one and two here: substantial contribution and do no significant harm. While the minimum safeguards uh, must be, uh, you, you, you need to use the guidelines and uh, guiding principles them, themselves. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it would be interesting to, to, to deep dive into some of the actual uh, delegated act with the with the technical criteria. Of course, not in detail, but maybe to to show how they are actually well, what they look like. Um, so they uh, are built up like this. This is these are snips from the actual uh, final draft for wind power. Uh, it starts with a description of uh, the economic activity itself uh, with the relevant uh, NACE codes. Uh, then there's uh, uh, there's a requirement for how to substantially contribute to climate change mitigation in this case, which is the, the relevant uh, um, environmental objective. Now for this one, it's really easy. Uh, it, it's basically it just states the activity generates electricity from wind power. So if you do that, then you're good with this criteria. Uh, then uh, on the right side, the do no significant harm criteria are listed. There's a uh, there's a section for each of the other five um, environmental objectives, uh, and in uh, good EU tradition, uh, these criteria are, um, well, but there's a lot of cross-referencing here. For climate change adaptation, there's a link to Appendix A of, uh, of the Annex itself. Um, and for numbers uh, three and uh, six at least, uh, there's, um, there's a reference to other um, EU pieces of regulation. So the, the, the assessment of whether or not uh, wind, the, your concrete wind power project is, is taxonomy aligned, will, is, you, you need, need to go into other regulations to, to figure that out. Um, for hydropower, um, the same setup, although here the criteria to substantially contribute are a little more complex. There's uh, three of them. I will not go into detail, and I, I suspect that some of the audience uh, know this a lot better than me in, in, in detail what this actually means. But the point is that uh, the, the different um, methods of energy production are not treated equally. Wind power is very easy. Uh, hydropower is, is, is more complex. And uh, this is even uh, a reduction, I think, of what was uh, uh, originally proposed. The do no significant harm uh, part on the right side is uh, is also more complex here. As you see, I only had room for uh, the first and uh, number two and half of number three, and uh, these criteria actually go on for another two pages. Uh, so that's uh, more complex as well. But again, you see that there's cross references to other EU legislations. Um, my third and last example, shipping uh, or sea and coastal freight water transport. Again, the same um, uh, the same method, um, same build up. Um, on this one, um, the minimum requirements for substantial contribution is fairly easy. Uh, the vessels have zero direct tailpipe CO2 emissions, 
and then goes on for letters B, C, D with uh, some transitional um, uh, lighter touch uh, requirements. And then it's interesting to note that uh, uh, on the right side, on the top point two, uh, there's another layer of, of requirement for this one. It says vessels are not dedicated to the transport of fossil fuels. So this is not really related to the activity itself, but it's the use of the activity. So you can have a completely CO2 uh, zero uh, emitting vessel, but if it's used for transporting fossil fuels, it's not taxonomy aligned anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, then the you know, significant harm criteria are built up in the same way. But it's interesting to go back then to wind power and just note that uh, wind power does not have the same uh, criteria for, for, for use. So lo looking at this, it looks like uh, if you have a wind, uh, if you have a wind power producing, you know, a, a electricity producing wind power, uh, it doesn't really matter what the power is, the electricity is used for, um, different to uh, shipping. Um, we go on to reporting obligations and uh, indirect effects. Um, about the end was partly through this, I'll do it briefly. Uh, for the taxonomy itself, um, non-FS, meaning, meaning non-financial uh, services industry uh, undertakings, uh, must report if they are large and of public interest. Uh, uh, they need to report uh, the proportion of turnover, capital expenditure and operating expenditure that is taxonomy aligned. Mm. And then um, for financial undertakings, they must, uh, uh, in addition, if they are covered by the uh, large undertaking public interest, uh, in addition, they must also uh, uh, report or disclose the proportion of investments, lending and underwriting that is related to taxonomy aligned activities. Uh, this is from the draft delegated act that came a few days ago, but uh, yeah, if that, that's, the, that's the way it looks right now. And there's also uh, the SFDR and other uh, requirements for the financial services industry that Bartelian mentions. I will not go through that. But it's maybe interesting to note that uh, the, the latest development on the non-FS part is that there's a, a suggestion to, uh, to introduce a new uh, regulation called CSDR that will then change so that uh, change the category here so that it would read large undertakings and public interest undertakings, which would, I think, uh, increase the number of companies in the EU that must report from something like 11,000 to 50,000. Um, a little further into the reporting, uh, non-financial undertakings will report using three different KPIs. Uh, as I mentioned, turnover, capital expenditure and operating expenditure. And this is uh, an example, um, uh, uh, imagining that there's a company uh, doing aquaculture and real estate. I'm not sure if it's practical, but it works as an example. Uh, for their turnover, they would not be able to uh, report anything for aquaculture since there is no criteria available yet. Uh, while for real estate, they would uh, look into what buildings, which of their buildings are taxonomy aligned, uh, which are not. But then moving on to uh, capital expenditure and operating expenditure, uh, uh, there was an interesting clarification in the Delegated Act that came uh, 21st April, stating that even if you are operating in a sector where there's no criteria, you could report uh, both capital expenditure and operating expenditure uh, that uh, were acquisitions basically for taxonomy aligned uh, goods and services. So this company would, would then be able to calculate that both for capex and, and opex if they have any. Um, then this takes us on to the indirect effects. Um, my theory, this of course, but uh, if uh, I think it's logical, uh, since large undertakings uh, must disclose to what ex extent uh, they have uh, economic activities that are taxonomy aligned, they will want to boost that, uh, and they may include investments to achieve taxonomy alignment and purchase of taxonomy aligned goods and services. Uh, this should mean that um, 
basically all businesses that deliver to large undertakings or undertakings that need to report could benefit from being able to brand their products as taxonomy aligned. Uh, and this then, in my opinion, should mean that basically all businesses should consider whether they have uh, activities and products that are in fact or could be taxonomy aligned. Uh, yeah, as an example, uh, to the right, I put uh, purchase of taxonomy aligned electricity, like for instance, wind power um, or leasing. Uh, taxonomy aligned uh, building, office building. Um, the requirements for the financial industry have the same kind of effect. Since the EU action plan implements uh, different requirements for the financial services industry, that will affect the products that they offer and the clients that they or what clients they offer it to, uh, and also how the financial industry act when they are uh, acting as investors. Uh, they will need to uh, uh, collect a lot of information from their clients and from their investment targets to ensure compliance and manage climate related risks, giving the same effect. Uh, all companies that uh, need financing, uh, like basically every company, should therefore be aware of and assess their activities and ability to become taxonomy aligned. And the sustainable finance disclosure regulation is one of the examples to that. Um, so then, uh, looking at it even broader, I think that uh, the disclosure requirements for large undertakings have uh, will will use the taxonomy and have a large effect. Uh, the action plan on sustainable finance, uh, with requirements for the financial industry, will have the same effect and also use the taxonomy. And then on uh, on the left side, there's a growing development where public investment programs, public incentives programs and maybe even public procurement uh, would also use the taxonomy. This is not uh, uh, final yet, but uh, for instance, in the Invest EU program and the European Investment Bank will will use it. And it's uh, it's uh, logical, in my opinion, that that will uh, grow, which will give the uh, ability to demonstrate taxonomy alignment a very wide, wide ranging significance. Um, coming up um, in 2021, this is not completely updated, I see, but uh, already this month is supposed to come a, a recommendation for a possible neutral and brown taxonomy um, that, that will sort of help the, the situation we have that, that uh, a, a lot of industry sectors are, are, are not covered at all, meaning that they are uh, that, that, that they will look brown since they are not green. So then it, it, it makes sense to, to, to make a neutral and a brown taxonomy. Some activities are, of course, basically neutral and does not affect uh, the climate. Um, then in June, we will have draft criteria for the, the other four environmental objectives. Uh, in Q3, final recommendations. Uh, in December, a commission report on the social taxonomy and potential neutral and brown taxonomies. And then from uh, 22, uh, reports will need to be made um, by the companies that are uh, directly affected and have mandatory reporting. And then uh, I think it's fair to say that we will lack a lot of data uh, still in 2022, and especially going back to 2021. Uh, so probably there will be a lot of transitional uh, measures to in, to make the reporting easier for the first year or so. It's my guess. That's it. There we go. Thank you. Uh, I will be talking about the EU taxonomy regulation a little bit from the outside, from the co uh, company perspective. And so to speak, how it, there are a lot of things here that is slipping without the, uh, the, the eyes of the taxonomy and, and perhaps is not as green as we think. Uh, next. Green is seen as a business opportunity. Uh, it used to have the status from a compulsory license to operate a scheme to become a strategy that uh, now are more than just the forerunners of the economy. 
So it's seen as a business opportunity for many, and we are see this as a, the increasing attention around becoming green, and green is good for business more and more. But what we uh, what we still see is that there are a lot of contradictions between uh, being green in an economic sense and the uh, issue around environmental protection and and uh, when it comes to uh, avoid uh, habitat fragmentation and destroying ecosystem and so forth. So this growth is a contradiction, contradiction, and then some of the other elements that comes into clash with the kind of the three dimensions of sustainability or the 17th, if you want. Next. There is still, of course, uh, this call for coordinated action and which the taxonomy is a good example of. We need this. It will make this whole system more predictable. It uh, makes it coordinated and it also brings in the issue about fairness. So this taxonomy thing is uh, trying to do this and trying to find a coordinated responsibility that has to be taken others by the industry themselves. Next. My question then is everything reading with the taxonomy? Let's move on and have a critical eye on this question. Next. Uh, I want to raise the issue about rebound effects. Uh, and rebound effects operates across sectors and geographies. This means it's about a seemingly positive effects may do negative harm to the environment that offsets the advantages. So the questions we've already dealt about, about the wind power making a polluted product would be an example of that. And uh, we, the problem is that the really investigation about whether we have rebound effects uh, or not is not really taken into account in many of these calculations. Uh, first of all, we lack full information. We have no full responsibility and control when it comes to components of the production systems, especially when they come out outside Europe. We don't really know them to full details and there are also kind of third party contributors to the process or to the value chain. Uh, another critical eye on this matter is the focus on just greenhouse emissions. Uh, perhaps greenhouse emissions on the one hand versus the energy intensity or energy contribution on the other side. And this makes us forget the really to consider the serious forms of impact, such as loss of bio biodiversity, aerial fragmentation, uh, social components, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are listed in the taxonomy system, but still we see more and more of the reports and attentions around greenhouse emissions and energy efficiency. I just saw a recent report from one of the regional banks. Uh, asking a consultancy company to uh, see uh, to what extent one could uh, uh, view the the hydro uh, investments, hydropower investments in the eye of the taxonomy system. And their main focus was the emissions and the energy systems, not these other elements. They were listed up only as bullet points, like uh, whether there was some uh, biodiversity fragmentation, whether there were other negative considerations regarding this element. And I think that's part of this large problem here. What we do not uh, also take into account is that whether the investment has a bad impact on one or more of these dimensions will also uh, depend on location, it will depend on the scale of the investment or the project or item or whatever. 
And of course, it has also to do with the time frame. And this operates across sectors. And that's, that makes it very complicated to really measure, measure these elements. But they have to be taken into account if we want to um, uh, consider this taxonomy system to be transparent and, and, and uh, a, a real uh, serious measure. Next. This brings me to the other element, which is the replacement effects. This is pinpointing a greener choice again. It can be on an individual level, a company that makes an investment, or it could be a kind of a political level issue. For example, investing into a greener infrastructure. But then again, it's again an example of renewal that will perhaps give a, a energy efficiency gain in the one hand, but it has to then be also measured again, not only uh, again the, the effects of the item, but also the increase of the total consumption due to a replacement. This goes uh, for use of materials uh, or, or that, that may be polluting elsewhere. So it's not only kind of the, the item itself, but it's the replacement and the whole large picture which has to do with the total total volume of consumption, which is part of the problem when we look into the sustainability goals. Next. We could use the electrical car, which is a classical example in this account. Uh, car number two in the household use of car in the electrical car instead of public transport or cycling. A form of energy producing electricity may be polluted. And what about the working conditions around different items of the value chain of the electrical car? For example, the battery, the, the lithium mines in Congo, emissions from nickel production, etc. And less expensive is expenses uh, by use of private car cars that um, uh, due to lower energy prices that uh, electricity is, could be then used for spending, uh, giving the, the household a larger spending power, and from that another holiday flying to Florida. This is also part of the rebound effects. We can also find it when we move on from the private sector to the commercial sector, we will have the similar arguments, this and also along with the replacement for ships, the maritime sector transferring into new um, energy carriers, airplanes, etc. Who and how, what do we do with the, the previous generation of equipment? Will they still be running uh, somewhere else. Next. Uh, next. Yeah. So, in other words, we need to minimize the negative rebound and replacement effects in the mechanism we choose. So, we need to bring the whole value chain into our calculations. We need to consider the responsibility to all geographical levels of the value chain, legally, ethical, socially, ecological sense. And this is goes, of course, both within the EU where this uh, regulation system is, but also for the outside world, as it has to do with the impact, but they are also very much involved in a lot of the value chains. So we need for a call of life cycle assessment. Uh, and in this lays also the importance of the tricky temporal dimension into these accounts. What these things that were investments generations ago and the extensive and the, the, the duration of the products. So this with the use of material, circulation abilities, disposals, etc. This again calls for the attention to bring in other components than just the greenhouse emissions and uh, also look into 
uh, if there are other options to kind of extend the products. Next. Is for, for example, circulation feasible? Depend on who is asking. Is it worth it uh, taking, uh, making arrangements for material recovery, sufficient quality to be brought into the new value change or are the additional arrangements uh, in a way that make it worthwhile uh, collecting the materials for new uh, generations of production or is it more energy in the cost of collecting transportation that's also an issue into this. Next. What I'm saying here or what I've tried to explain is that there are so many things going on that's not like one sector and the taxonomy system. What about those within a sector that really needs to go green? That's another matter. Should they not have a favorable funding position to make them more environmental friendly? Or should the taxonomy be picking just the winners of those who are already uh, very much green and are obviously winners of this green game? Uh, I also find it problematic that um, there are so many industries and value chains that operates across sectors. Daniel gave us several examples of that, how parts of the company could be uh, defined as green or in the correspondent of what is defined as green in the taxonomy, whereas other parts are not. And this may also be very tricky. And I in the, the, the extension of this issue, I think we also need to address the issue whether the public sector is financial uh, support or I, I'd say public investment programs. Uh, should they be uh, have a different role than the commercial financial sector when it comes to to turning the industry or the economy green? Should they perhaps be supporting the non-green businesses in their uh, struggle to turn green, being something that can compensate for market failure? And should they also be to, uh, the ones that are covering up for the weaknesses that we already have mentioned about the taxonomy regime? So it should kind of be something else and for those that are not there. OK, I just added some in the next. I just added some references if you want to read more about this. Thank you very much. Last slide.